hope everybody's stoked about the topic today. Uh, so this is our fifth, so welcome back to the uh, repeat patrons to the pub. Um, what I find really interesting is when we look at crypto, uh, we're looking at something that's decentralized and borderless. And so if we look at who we've got on the call today, we don't just have people um, from around my neck of the woods in Toronto, Canada. We've also got participants from the US, the UK, Pakistan and India, um, Saudi Arabia as well. So Dev, you brave soul, if I can pass it to you for a quick story of what, um, what you had discovered last year with your team, I think it'll shed some light and set a great tone for what we're going to discuss today. Uh... This wasn't last year, this was many years ago. <laughs> Before crypto, Bitcoin was even known amongst most people. Um, so I was doing minding my own business, doing an AML investigation, and a colleague behind me um, said, um, Dev, um, I'm looking at this kid, a 17, 18 year old, and he's got lots of these credits and debits going in and out of his account. And I, I, I don't know what he's doing. These really small amounts and all I've got are these um, uh, on the payment reference um, these very long codes and without even turning around I said those are Bitcoin wallet IDs and I, and I tried to explain the concept of uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency virtual and I mentioned all these words then more of the team started to turn around oh what's that about where is it if it's virtual where does it exist How who, how does it, where did it come from? Who, how do you, and all sorts of questions. And uh, so then I just s stood there in front of the uh, AML investigations team of colleagues, trying to explain what, uh, based on the uh, Satoshi paper I'd read uh, a few weeks before um, that I'd found online. And, and I just found the whole um, uh, thing fascinating at the time. It's interesting because now it's become um, such a popular um, topic for people to latch on to that may or may not um, comprehend its, um, the full gravitas of how it has infiltrated daily life for many um, and in different facets. And now we even see in Canada, the regular regulator has taken this on um, as something that we should start to regulate. So we'll get into a bit more of the, the regulations and, and what that means shortly and what it may or may not be encompassed there. Um, but Stephen, I was hoping um, you could tell us a little bit about you know, in principle, what the flow of funds looks like for a crypto transaction, how it might look differently than a traditional, you know, fiat bank investigation. Yeah, we can see the origins or at least um, the checkpoints that the funds went to prior to it coming to our exchange, for instance. And most other organizations can as well that have blockchain analytics tools like Chain Analysis or Elliptic. So with cash, you're not going to be able to see if a drug dealer dropped it off at his grandmother's house and the grandmother comes and deposits cash saying that it was under her bed. Whereas we can see if funds went to a mixer, the dark net, or even through other exchanges. So with cryptocurrency exchanges, all of us are very open with information that's not personal identifying information. So we can kind of query another exchange if we see funds coming from there and kind of ping them and say like, was this fund suspicious? And we do have groups where we do talk about stolen funds or hack funds. So there's a lot more communication, A, and B, there's a lot more transparency in what we're seeing and how the funds are changed when it gets to our exchange. I think it was chain analysis that said a lot of the new one is chain hopping. So going from BTC or Bitcoin and then getting to an exchange, changing it quickly to like Ethereum and then moving it off the exchange. And there's some there as far as public private partnerships, I know there's there's going to be a lot of P's in the following statement, but there's project participate um, is something to do with the uh, the crypto exchanges. Can you give us a little bit of insight into that? Well, it was actually started by Leo Real, who's part of Tether. Obviously, Peter Work was a big influence in that and just bringing together all the stakeholders. So cryptocurrency exchanges, service providers blockchains and analytical tool companies and to give the information to regulators i guess the regulators are saying hey you have to determine suspicious activity and file a report but there's no real information as to what was suspicious activity so me and a couple other people along with others in the, including amber from outlier created what are some of the typologies what are some of the things we're seeing in regards to suspicious indicators so that the regulators could use that to kind of form um, the regulations and legislation and mostly their guidance as to what companies should be looking for and reporting so obviously a big breakthrough uh, and then aligned several of the companies i don't know if amber wants to add in anything to that 
I, I would just say there, there are always things that are um, that are going on in that arena. So if you're if you're interested in knowing more about the typologies that have been developed, um, or if you wanted to be involved in terms of some of the Canadian working groups, um, reach out to myself or Giles, and we can help you um, get involved. So we had another question come in. Uh, this one was from Mohammed Nakib. I don't believe he's on yet, but. Uh, is it time for banks and financial institutions to consider studying digital assets? I think um, I think it's really important that people start to learn about this thing. I know I've been in the room before. We had people working for some of the larger financial institutions saying that they don't deal with crypto and that it doesn't touch their organization. And um, I found that a very interesting statement because I, I don't know that they could really ascertain that they, it for sure does not. Um, there, there was an. Uh, what is, what is this Canadian club? <laughs> Joseph, nice. Well done. Um, there was one, uh, Paul. I don't know if you wanted to ask the question, or if you'd like me to ask it for you. But you were speaking a bit about some of the tools and uh, looking to see if there was either a recommendation or some information on them. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're touching on it, Jennifer. We uh, really just curious about how the analytics tools can be used to check source of funds as a, um, uh, a check against funds that are coming in, potentially, you know, being placed and how do you prevent that? I mean, any money laundering program, you have to be able to combat, deter, and detect. So really the tools are to do all three functions, right? Um, at the end of the day, can you combat money laundering by investigating? Can you deter it by not accepting or not sending? Uh, or that's actually preventable. Deterring based on indicators or red flags that come in outside of the crypto space. I think it's the tools that are there, like chain analysis and cipher trace and stuff, they, they give you a great insight, but it's also all the other things that are around it. So I think it's just another, uh, if I have my tool belt set, that would just be another tool that my tool belt would set. I, I would add to that, and it's probably um, a little bit pedantic, but the tools themselves aren't going to do a determination of source of funds. Um, and so most of the time, most of the wallet addresses, um, you might not necessarily know who those are. You think it's a private user, you think it's an exchange, whatever the answer to that is. But it would indicate for you if it was likely that these funds were coming from the dark web or that the address was associated with illegal activity. And so while you don't get into the thing, you know, where you're talking about, well, I got this Bitcoin for the sale of my boat, um, it won't give you that type of specificity, but it will tell you that it doesn't seem like the Bitcoin is coming from a criminal source or a known criminal source. Um, and that's probably, I, I think, a fairly important distinction about what you can and can't determine with these types of tools. To add to what Amber is saying, um, there's a lot of t very powerful tools in the industry, especially for blockchain intelligence tools. Uh, Stephen and me, I think we've tested like six of them. Um, each one have their pros and cons. Uh, but to add to what Amber was saying, there's many ways somebody can get cryptocurrency. There's a like over a thousand different businesses it could have come from. Um, what these tools allow, uh, what these tools do, do for you is they guide your investigation. Because uh, if somebody tells you, oh, I got my, um, you know, I deal in cryptocurrency, there's a, a hundred different ways that that cr cryptocurrency could have gotten to them. And your blockchain uh, analytics tool is just going to guide you as to what questions to ask and give you an idea of the enhanced due diligence measures you can place on this user.